so I thought I would, um, maybe I should have titled this talk, uh, machine learning for millimeter wave, it will work. I don't know, but um, so I thought I would uh, look at, there's a lot, been a lot of talk about machine learning in general in wireless um, since it's just, uh, I thought I would focus here on millimeter wave, not that I think it is necessarily the most important application is just the area I'm most familiar with. So I want to try to start off by maybe giving some high level reasons of why I think it might be useful, but also maybe um, understand kind of the limitations of what I think we could expect. Uh, I, there, there's so much work in the area of machine learning. I took just some representative high level uh, quick description of some of the projects I'm working on, but I, again, I don't think these are the limits of that. And maybe if we have time, we can have a discussion about uh, what's happening going forward. All of these projects are really looking at machine learning to help millimeter wave communication. But there's the other side of that coin, which is, um, I think probably where more the industry is actually interested, which is using wireless to help mobile AI, that is making AI mobile and pervasive. Um, I'm just gonna summarize some of the other work in our group and some of the stuff that we've collaborated with, but just a, a really high level uh, view of that and maybe give some perspectives on this. So um, with that in mind, let's just start talking about millimeter wave for if there are sort of machine learning people here who are not familiar with millimeter wave, um, what it refers to is really, uh, the millimeter refers to specifically the wavelength of the communication in, uh, in radio communication. And um, so of course, typically the, the or does, does any, do people actually need a background on millimeter wave? If I'm not, I'll just skip this. I, I, I don't think so. Okay, let's just, let's just skip this. Okay, so maybe I'll just uh, zoom, uh, zoom ahead here. So of course, um, millimeter, 5G millimeter wave is here right now. We started looking at this, you know, years ago, but it's accelerated very quickly. So these are some pictures of some handsets that uh, a reporter took out to the field. Um, just when the trial deployments were getting out. And um, this, this is actually a really great paper for those who have, I found it on the web. It's from a group out in Minnesota that did some field trials of taking the Verizon's handsets and made some fairly careful measurements. And the results are good and bad. So the good part is you do get peak data rates. It's not shown on this graph, but sometimes they're in excess of a gigabit per second. But you do see really that the coverage is very intermittent in this case. So for example, it's, you're getting a lot of handovers back to 4G where the signal drops and it's not even a particularly high mobile environment. They're just literally walking. And some of these, some of these drops are parts where the coverage is really an outage, but a lot of these are probably just blocking events. And that sort of brings you to the kind of questions that people are really having with millimeter wave. And these are challenges that we knew that we would, they're not entirely unexpected. And so some of the challenges, of course, are just because it's highly directional communication and that leads to a lot of tracking, what we know a lot about. What we're seeing in that other graph um, is of course this blockage issue that we know millimeter wave signals get blocked they have limited range, but there's also other issues, you know, associated with the high power consumption. That particular device actually burnt the battery down very fast. And some of the early field trials, uh, they actually needed a separate battery pack to get it even working. And a broader issue is that, of course, and, you know, Jeff's uh, done a lot of work on this. And this was the same problem with all small cell deployments that the main barrier, at least in the United States, was getting the high level of network connectivity for this. Now, I don't think that, um, I think that machine learning can't obviously overcome these fundamental issues in some very fundamental way. There's some, they're fundamentally related to just the propagation, for example. But I do think it can help somewhat in the millimeter wave range. I would say it's, I wouldn't say it's a fundamental technology that's gonna revolutionize anything, but I think it may be a useful tool for optimizing designs somewhat. So it, millimeter wave kind of naturally works well for machine learning for a number of reasons. The first is just that the propagation is very complex to model. So you've typically benefited at the lower frequencies from fairly simple analytic models that are both kind of computationally tractable and sort of representative. But that's just simply no longer the case in the millimeter wave bands, also try to make a clear. 
The second part about it is that there's a lot of site-specific characteristics to propagation that one could potentially learn in a, in a machine learning context that could improve particular base station uh, performances. The other part is that there's just a lot of complex multi-user interactions, particularly with the uh, inter uh, directivity. And the devices are also quite a bit nonlinear, as I'll show near at the end of the uh, talk. And so one can imagine that machine learning can kind of work well in all these environments because you do not have actually exact models in these areas. And because of this, uh, if you just take a brute force classical communication approach to the design, it might be computationally expensive. So with that in mind, let me just walk you through a couple of example projects that we've been working on in the group. Um, so let's first start with the project on channel modeling with the sort of generative neural network. So last year, I, uh, I was very lucky. I had my sabbatical in uh, Barcelona with Angel Lozano's group. And uh, there I met actually Jeff's former postdoc, Giovanni Grassi, um, who's gotten into for various reasons into uh, UAVs. And then we started collaborating on this project. And the first thing that we wanted, so we basically wanted to understand millimeter wave communications for UAVs, which is kind of a natural application for um, a millimeter wave because you can get fairly high, um, you, you, you can use basically line of sight connectivity and get very high data rates to these uh, vehicles. Uh, the main issue though was every time we started to think about this is that we needed channel models and um, at that we try to struggle of what the, how we would get this and then we realized that okay maybe actually maybe machine learning is actually not a bad idea for this so let me explain um for those who are not familiar with sort of simulations what we typically do when you're trying to do a system study like a capacity uh, evaluation so typically what you'll do is if you open up like the 3 gpp spec they give you what's called a jet but they they don't call it a generative model but it's really a generative model it's just this so imagine i have like a base station and a uav or a ue and what you do is that um that environment will be characterized by a number of conditions like the distance uh, between the two devices, maybe the cell type, the cell height, and so on, and maybe also some environmental scenario like an urban micro, urban macro. And then what these models will do is that they will say, okay, um, I will generate a random channel uh, based on what we've observed in the past on um, on links in similar conditions. And that channel will be described by a number of different parameters. For example, it'll say whether it's a line of sight or non-line of sight, it'll maybe talk about the number of paths, their angles, and so on. Now, what you do with this is the following. Typically, when you want to try to make a study, um, and Jeff's done many, many of these uh, studies in his uh, career, uh, you do the following. You say, okay, for you start off with what's called a deployment model. And the deployment model will be some kind of parameters like, say, okay, the base stations are located at a certain density with a certain maybe structure like hexagonal structure. Then you kind of drop these uh, UEs or mobiles in this structure. Right? This, this is just one example. It could be an indoor, whatever it is. After this, you then go to use this generative model, which will generate the random links between the base stations and all the nodes. And then based on the channels and their locations, you can then run any performance evaluation you want, for example, a capacity evaluation and so on. So the question then, this is sort of what's needed to do any evaluation. And so the question that we were struggling with was how to get this generative model for our UAV case, because there was not really much known about what would happen at in the millimeter wave frequencies in aerial uh, lakes. So just to give you an idea about some of the complexity of this is the following. If you open up these um, uh, modeling models, they'll describe the channel like this. They'll say it's kind of a physical spatial cluster model. So if you've taken a wireless class, you've probably um, seen one of these. You'll have some base station and a UE. And it'll say, OK, between this base station and UE, there will be a number of paths. And each path will have some angles and delays and gains and so on. Essentially, then, if you take a large number of paths, say in the order of 20, for the number of parameters, say around six, this is an over 100 dimensional object that you're trying to um, model. So you're trying to model the statistical distribution of basically a high dimensional object. And in addition to the high dimensionality of this, there's kind of mixed data types in here. And there's obviously going to be some kind of correlations 
between these um, variables. So 3GPP and its modeling framework has sort of made some kind of implicit assumption by the way that they tell you to generate these models. But the question is we really didn't know whether those kind of assumptions were realistic. So we thought, well, maybe we could use machine learning for this as a kind of a black box method to learn that statistical distribution of these parameters. And the benefit there being that there would be fairly minimal statistical assumptions in this approach, provided that we have enough data. And that brings me to the next point, all machine learning methods, if you can learn very high dimensional representation uh, statistical distributions, but to learn those, of course, you need to have data and the data grows with the kind of dimension of this. So the question is where can we get data from? There's very limited measurements, particularly in aerial settings for millimeter wave, just simply because the payload is very high to take those measurements. So we thought we would resort to ray tracing, which has been kind of the default go-to uh, tool for a lot of machine learning studies in this field. So um, the, one of the tools you'll see cited, if you probably haven't worked with this yourself, is the one coming from REMCOM, which is just an amazing tool. So what we did is we downloaded um, five cities uh, uh, data, approximately about a kilometer squared, actually maybe a little more, maybe about uh, one and a half kilometer squared area of five very dense areas around the globe. And took an, in each location a number of UAV locations and a number of base stations. And we looked at two base station types, one which would be mounted on the top of a roof that would be kind of dedicated um, to for aerial coverage. And the second are street level locations that might be dedicated for terrestrial users, but maybe wanted to see if it's possible to get coverage out. Um, uh, coverage uh, to the aerial links. Total that gave us about 200,000 um, links total to train and about maybe 20 to 50,000 um, per city. So, and these things we could model up to about 25 links per path and that actually models all the diffractions and reflections. It actually does not model diffuse scattering because that actually, as you know, from ray tracing, that's a little harder to model. So it's probably one of the inaccuracies of this along with the, uh, I can talk to you more about the inaccuracies, maybe I'll mention that later on. All right, so this is what we thought we would fit as a machine learning model. So basically we want to somehow capture <clears throat> that distribution. So each path of these 220,000 links is described by a basically large vector. That large vector of all the paths, or at least the, let's say top 25 paths and their path losses, their gains, and then their actual angular orientation. So this is a kind of a 120 dimensional object in this case, because we tried uh, tried to plot the top 20 paths. So this is what we want to do. Let's just look at the inside and the, the uh, inputs and the outputs. So the inputs will be say, okay, I have a base station and I have a UAV and they're going to have, um, they're going to be separated in some horizontal and vertical distance. And there's also going to be some characteristics of the base station cell. At the output, what I wanted to do is generate a random instance of this path vector given this condition. So basically modeling the conditional distribution of that vector X given you. So we thought we'd kind of have a two stage model. The first is um, sort of follows the three GPP style that you would run through a network and it would tell you at the end, whether it's just a line of sight and non line of sight, because that's very key. We knew this was, uh, so it's not an entirely black box. I mean, we're using a little bit of our knowledge about um, a way that uh, the physics should work in propagation. So we first say it's the line of sight, non-line of sight. Then we feed that into another network and it generates the non-line of sight paths from this as some kind of generative model for this. And we would sample from that. And then we, if, if it was non-line of sight, we'd go back and add that line of sight. There's a lot of other details, which I won't get into, but that's basically a high level idea. All right, so let's first take a look at this first stage of the model, which is that link state predictor network. All right, and so again, it's taking these inputs about the, you know, basically the low relative location, and it's going to make a prediction about um, uh, whether it's a line of sight, non-line of sight, or whether the link is an outage. So here's two examples. So um, let's look at the city of Moscow, if you train this. The left part is the actual empirical distribution on the test data with a higher color, which is meaning higher probability. So of course, just physically, if you get closer, you have a higher chance of getting a line of sight, but there's also an elevation effect. And you can see it sort of captures that basic uh, basic 
characteristic here in the probability uh, probability distribution. You can see that actually when you're below the cell, particularly on a um, aerial cell, you have a very low chance of getting a line of sight link, and that's not surprising because it's uh, blocked by the roof. Dedicated cells are the ones that are on the aerial roof mounted, and the standard cells are the ones that are ground mounted, like uh, this. All right, so you can get these kind of distributions. That that's but that's actually not that surprising and not that hard to get. The harder part is to deal with the, the with the remaining all the other angular parameters. So let's just talk a little bit about in general how you try to fit um, uh, fit probability distributions. So when you think of a generative model. Okay, what I'm doing is this mathematically. I have some characteristics, which might back to you. And then I'm going to give it some random data, like uh, which I'll, let's call it Z, which is just all the random numbers that I'm going to uh, generate. And I want it to pop out an X that kind of matches some distribution that I observe. And what do I mean by that? So I get some training data of pairs of UI and XI. This is not a supervised learning problem. This is an unsupervised learning problem. Um, because I'm really just learning this uh, distribution on this X. And I want to find those parameters to kind of match so that this, this, the implicit distribution I get of X given you kind of matches what I observe in this um, training data. So if you take like a detection and estimation class, what they will tell you to do is the following. They'll say, okay, you compute what's called the likelihood. If I take this, these parameters theta in my generative model, so for every parameter theta, I have some probability distribution implicitly from X given U, all right? And then what it will tell you to do is try to maximize the, that, the likelihood of the parameters given uh, the evidence that I've seen. So that's what you would do in sort of classic detection and estimation. The problem though, is when you have these latent variables Z, the, um, that probability, of course, you have to get with an integral because you have to integrate out that probability of that uh, Z. And this becomes very complex to actually evaluate when Z is high dimensional, all right? And so there's no simple form to this. And so you need some kind of approximate solution. So a lot of methods are based on basically approximating this kind of calculation in some way. So the way, there are kind of two classical techniques, of course, for um, generative models. One's GANs and the others is uh, variational autoencoders. We just pick this, I wouldn't say that this is, we pick the VAE because it's actually easier somewhat to train. It's a little more stable for those who had experience doing this, but I wouldn't rule out that someone could do this again. So you probably will get similar result. All right, so we wanna fit this um, generative model from this data. So typically you want to do some kind of likelihood estimation. You know, you know, just a quick one slide summary of VAEs, but that's obviously um, too hard. So typically what you do is you bound something called the evidence lower bound, and you take basically some conditional distribution Q, which basically approximates the posterior. So if I give you the condition U and the X, I want to say, I want to estimate Z. So this is going to approximate the posterior distribution of Z given U, and you then put this into this giant crazy equation, right? And this giant crazy equation here is basically this kind of likelihood term here plus a KL divergence term. I don't wanna go into the details of this, but this is something called this evidence lower bound. And then what you do is you parametrize this Q. So if that was too much math, this is all that's happening. It's kind of simple when you think about it just structurally. I take my condition U and I have some X and I have something called the encoder, which is basically going to sample from an approximation of this. It's going to guess what this latent variable Z is um, given X. It's going to sample from this. And then given Z from this, I'm going to sample my X. And then I'm going to have two terms. One is that the samples of Z should kind of match what the prior I expect on Z. And then the second is that the X hat should match what the actual X's I observe. So these two are just two networks that you can parametrize any way you like and then maximize the parameters of this function. And that is called this evidence flow about. And in the case of a VAE, you just make these two neural networks. All right, so the actual parameters that we used for this, we just modeled these as basically not even deep neural networks, just simply two layer neural networks with like not that many parameters in the order of about 40,000. It does require a huge number of epochs to train. Um, I'm not exactly sure why it takes so long to converge, but that's just uh, what we observed. So maybe there's another area of improving that. 
So let's take a look at the results. So how do you actually measure if a uh, one distribution matches another distribution? So what you can do is the following. I can say, okay, I have my test data, which I didn't use for training. And I can look at some statistic. Well, because I'm looking, I actually try to model a conditional distribution. So I'm going to look at um, some statistic, any function of that, uh, that data Xi and plot its CDF. And then similarly generate samples Xi from the same condition and plot those statistics and they should match. So what we'll do is just plot some statistics that are probably relevant for systems analysis. So let's just say I'm gonna plot the omnidirectional path loss. And this is what you get. So you get this, um, this blue curve is what you um, observe in the test data. And you see that we can actually match it quite well. All right, we, and this is matching it for both the dedicated cells and the standard cells. And it can very much pick up these differences between these uh, two cells. And we can match them. There's some inaccuracy, but the inaccuracy is way out when you're at links that are like 180 dB. You're never going to see these anyway. I mean, the limit of probably any communications around that 150 dB point, and you're matching these extremely well in this case. You can also uh, capture other interesting aspects. Remember, this is a full double directional model, so it has like all the paths. So what we looked at, for example, was just the angular distribution of paths as a function of distance. Now I'll point out here just at the outset that when you look at just a standard 3GPP model, it doesn't even account for the fact just the angular spread is kind of con constant with the distance. But what you observe is, that, of course, that as the UAV and base station get further and further apart, you actually see much more angular dispersion in the paths, which is what you would expect because the paths are coming from a much uh, wider range. You also see a lot more dispersion near the um, base station side because it's actually, of course, it's getting in the clutter. It's where there's a lot of uh, um, ground reflections. So with this, you, you can actually pick up all these relations. So on the left column here, this is for the city of Tokyo, I've looked at the um, angular dispersion of the uh, four angles because it's uh, both the elevation and azimuth and the uh, arrival and departure on the data and then plotted what, you know, we plot, we generate samples from the same distribution and you capture all those relations, right? You capture that they're mostly concentrated close to the line of sight. These are relative to the line of sight path, but you start getting more dispersion as you get further away in, uh, um, as you get closer in distance here. Okay, so that is, um, that. that's another option. So another nice thing about this is you can look at two types of, um, Generalization. So generalization is key in machine learning. It basically ask you how, if I've trained a model on some data, how will it, will it do with new data? So there's two ways to think about that when um, in, these, in the wireless setting. So I imagine I have a city like Beijing, and I have training and test data. So what you could do is you can um, take that training data and fit a model and then compare it on test data. And what you're doing then is you're kind of looking at how well that model um, but uh, generalizes to other locations within the same environment. So let's call that inter-environment generalizability. But you could also take that same model I've trained in Beijing and ask you, ask how well would it do in another city, all right? Or I could take a number of urban models and ask how well does it do in a suburban location, all right? And let's call that inter-environment generalization. Now, this is actually, the results are kind of mixed. So there are cases where you get very bad intra-environment generalization. So you, know, you can compare every, take every pair. And for example, you can take say the Beijing model. I train it on Beijing and then I look at how well it predicts in Moscow. And for some reason, I guess these two cities are very different. You know, you get actually very big discrepancies. They don't uh, generalize as well, uh, as well at all. On the other hand, for some reason, um, the London model if you train something in London and then you try to predict in Tokyo, it actually predicts quite well. And that kind of gives you an uh, idea that maybe how do we classify environments? I gave you a number of cities, you know, are there, what ways can we cluster cities that have similar characteristics or even more generally, is there kind of an environmental latent space? Now 3GPP has kind of implicitly made some guesses about this. So they'll, if you look up their modeling, they'll say there's an urban micro model, there's an urban macro model, a rural model. And so one of these models for each type of environment, the question is um, 
is that the actual right way to categorize environments or can we use machine learning trained all over a large ensemble of different environments try to find some kind of more data driven latent space to think about the way that environments work so that's a kind of open question uh, but it could definitely be approached pretty easily with a sufficient amount of data which you can generate from these ray tracing tools it's all right simple, um, um yeah this, this is this is great i just had a couple questions if, if, if it's okay yeah no that's great um, so you were actually trying to model like all of these different parameters or like the distributions of all these different parameters, like arrival angles and cluster yeah. size, path number of paths, not, not just like summary metrics, like path loss and, you know, or, or so on. Is, is that, that, that's right. Yes, exactly. It gives you a full 120 dimensional vector for every condition number. That's pretty amazing. And then I guess from that, you can generate like, for example, the channel matrix or exactly, okay. exactly. Um, and where did you get this, this, this wireless insight data? Is this publicly available or did you guys generate? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Actually, you know, I didn't, uh, this, I did the fundamental error of, uh, that should never be done in a machine learning talk that I didn't put the links to the GitHub. So we're making all the data. Okay. So you can get, um, wireless as an insight tool is publicly available. Um, normally you would have to pay, but given your group, I'm sure they'll just give it to you for free. So you just, no, and I can give we you have, we have to pay, we have to pay too. Oh, oh you do. Okay. <laughs> no, but it's reasonable. It's, they, they have an academic. Oh, you guys already have it. I know you guys have done work with that. that model. Yeah. Robert's group has done quite a bit. I, I, and we have a couple, couple of people in my group who are using it as well. Yeah. It's, it is, it is the, the best uh, tool that we, we found. Yeah. It's uh, so, um, we, we ran these, um, uh, we ran these data. We, the, I keep on the student, I've asked him to just design the web page So it'll have a nice download but if you actually go to the github there is a data downloader it'll download it'll download all this file for you so, okay, so, so it is available it is available you didn't you didn't have to did you guys build this data set though using like the the models of the city is that is that what you guys did yeah well yeah we just ran the tool on that data set so okay. we just we grabbed the 3d model and then just ran the, okay, ran gotcha. the tool on it and it popped it out um i'll show you some other pretty cool data sets that we have uh okay. later on Okay, so that so I yeah I'm I'm pretty excited. This is a kind of an interesting way to think about this. You can use these pretty in any type of uh, problem. So, uh, for example, let's say you want to do a system evaluation, which I don't want to get into too much in here because that's not the topic. But one of the the whole reason we started was to ask ourselves, okay, if you have a um, terrestrial base stations, remember terrestrial base stations are actually um, have some down tilt typically with them. And the question, and they're in the clutter, whether they would actually serve, um, be able to serve aerial base stations, or would you need kind of dedicated base stations in the uplink uh, uh, for this? So we could, because we have a full double directional model, you could easily place the antenna pattern, a realistic antenna pattern on the base station, as well as on the UAV, and measure this because you could just, it just applies the gain in each angle based on the sort of, uh, on, on, on the uh, radiation pattern. And then you can actually understand these kind of, uh, plots, this case plotting, for example, the SNR distribution under different densities of the aerial base stations. And you can see that in certain cases it increases. Um, I, I don't, it's, not, it's not relevant to go into the interpretation of this, but that's the kind of thing you can do with this, which is where we originally wanted. I just want to say there's actually a lot of other UAV work that we, I, I was not doing UAV work like until very recently. Um, these we've been looking at uh, a couple of things. One thing is trying to understand 140 gigahertz, which are high uh, link rate connections to UAVs. And we've been working um, with a lot of uh, very careful with some collaborators to get very careful um, antenna patterns on these uh, on these UAVs to try to estimate capacity. Again, I don't want to, that's not the main topic here, but I think there is actually kind of interesting work. What we're finding, I think another potential area for machine learning is not just the channel modeling, but the vibration modeling of the drone. And that could be, because again, once this is not a very good statistical, easy statistical model for this, this is where you might be able to apply machine learning. And that could become particularly interesting. I didn't put a page on it, but if you start looking at high rank line of sight MIMO, which has become the, probably the um, nearest short-term application for 140 gigahertz, all right, that's what, what's, for those who are not familiar with it, if you take, um, so what you learn in your wireless class is that 
if you have a line of sight point to point link, its spatial rank is one. And that's true in the far field, but if you move within the Rayleigh distance, then you'll actually be able to spatially resolve the different antennas uh, elements, and then you will actually get a higher rank channel. So that's a sort of well-known idea. It's just not that useful at lower frequencies, but at higher frequencies, the Rayleigh distance actually becomes much larger. So you'll be able to get a high rank connection. So you can get even hundreds of meters, you can get um, with a reasonable antenna aperture, have like a spatial rank of four or eight with a 140 gigahertz. But then that tracking problem might become difficult and then that might be a place where machine learning works. So just some ideas. Another area that we've been looking at is in just the radar detection, which is sort of a, it's a reasonably well-studied part. We've been looking at, for example, measuring radar cross sections, and there are interesting detection problems uh, on this. There are several groups working in this area, and this is another part that if you're interested more from the signal processing side, I think that's a potential application. All right, let's go on to the uh, second project. I, I won't spend as much time on these other ones. Um, Okay, uh, this is an area that sort of tons of people are looking at, which is in the area of beam tracking in millimeter wave, which is kind of a natural application. So the, uh, just kind of quickly, one of the aspects of um, millimeter wave signals, in addition to having very narrow beams, is that they're actually subject, so if, if you have narrow beams, of course, if there's any small orientation movement, then you have to track that. But there's also changes due to blockage. For example, these were experiments from Ted's group, uh, you know, a number of years ago. Uh, George is, uh, you know, left for Apple several years ago. And then he was making these kind of blocking measurements of walking between a transmitter and receiver, and then seeing these pretty deep drops between 20 and 40 dB. This is nothing that wasn't, you know, totally surprising. It, can be predicted by basic electromagnetic theory, right? But you can get these drops and I mean, they're, they're in the hundreds of milliseconds in this case. So it's totally trackable, but you do need to be able, you do need to track these, right? We started to, those were measurements with a horn antenna. So you can only measure in one direction at a time, but we wanted to try to understand um, how that would look at um, over when you were looking at multiple directions. So what we did, I'll just, you know, I don't want to go through too much uh, crap here. We, we, Got a phased array. This is fairly old right now, and we have better systems at the, for now. And what we did is we just took the two phased arrays of the transmitter and the receiver. And each one, this is an analog array. So we just scan a bunch of directions, and this one would scan a bunch of directions. And of course, it can scan this very, very fast as long as you have sufficient SNR. So you can then measure all the, the, um, the, the signal strength on every transmit receive direction uh, pair. So in this case, it was looking at 12 transmitted 12 received directions, and then so you'd get 144 directions. And then you could put in some kind of um, uh, dynamics into channel, and then track not just how it's behaving on along one direction, but then to behave, see how this would behave across multiple directions. So when you got in, um, these were some of the experiments that we were running several years ago now. Um, we had a, a, an indoor room with a transmitter and receiver, kind of representative of a, let's say, a home entertainment system. And then the students were walking between these and you would see these kind of complex blocking relate, uh, patterns. So in this case, the main path was blocked, but you would see these sort of um, secondary paths here and here and here, right? That was coming from a reflection. And we wanted to try to understand how to statistically model this and then also how maybe how to track this, uh, these kind of dynamics. So one area that we started looking at was um, just, actually this is my deal about a year old right now, was using just LSTMs or, but you can use any network you want, which is to try to track sort of multiple directions at a time. And we were looking at both with the 60 gigahertz data, as well as at that point, we were also trying to look at 140 gigahertz. At that time, we did not have any simulation um, experimental tools, but we could model it, we believe, fairly accurately with some kind of diffraction modeling and some random talk. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, you could get results. I don't want to go into all the details, but that's basically the uh, level idea. Now, we we're kind of we wanted to continue this to try to understand how this would look outdoors. So we went back to ray tracing again. This is one of the city sections in Virginia. And then we combined that with a motion planning tool. This one is actually one you can get from MATLAB. And you can just, it can plot out sort of a motion path that might be realistic. And then what we would do is superimpose on this 
other blockage models like a hand blockage model and so on to try to see how it would track from multiple base stations, right? So um, I know again, not maybe going into all the details, but we tried different algorithms in this case and you did actually see, I was kind of a skeptic because I thought, okay, tracking is fairly easy problem if you just do something generically okay, it'll work. Or maybe this wasn't the best baseline um, example uh, algorithm, but you could get fairly high uh, performance improvement using these LSTM techniques over kind of at least very simple baseline models using just like linear prediction uh, that's um, optimized to that uh, site. The other interesting aspect was that the LSTMs, this was at, um, this was at 28 gigahertz, but we had a fairly high dimensional array and we were tracking multiple base stations. So the raw data size was quite large. And then the way that you did the pre-processing turned out to be have some bearing on the results. So if you try to do some, try to do either no dimensional reality reduction or just simple PCA, you could actually outperform it by doing some kind of uh, auto encoder that was trained on that part. But those are kind of uh, details. You can probably play around with the data you set yourself and maybe get a little better results. There's an interesting part I thought that Jeff might like, which is also when he comes back to, uh, there's a reinforcement learning problem. So um, as I said, right at the beginning of the talk, one of the key issues with the millimeter wave is a high power consumption. So if you know mobile phones, actually the probably single biggest power saving feature on your phone is what's called discontinuous reception or DRX. And that just basically the phone goes to sleep and wakes up um, when only when it needs to. And there's a whole bunch of different phases where that's done. I don't want to go into the protocol details, but there's an obvious um, challenge of doing this in a millimeter wave system. Because when you go to sleep and then when you wake up, you have to listen in some direction. And the question is in what direction you're going to listen to. And the longer you go to sleep, the worse that direction is. So you need to, even if you're in idle, you need to be waking up just to track the um, track the uh, directions. And that kind of results in a, um, in a, a uh, optimization uh, optimization problem. So let me just illustrate it like this. So imagine that the, what happens in these base, in, uh, these uh, new radio systems is the following: so you'll have a base station, and say you're trying to track two base stations. Um, each one of them will be broadcasting uh, data, uh, sorry, synchronization signals at different beams. So first it'll transmit in this brown direction, then the green direction, and so on. So if you had power wasn't an issue, what you would do is just listen to all those directions. And then you say, okay, now I found the best direction and you go back to sleep until the next time you have to wake up and then you can listen to all the directions. But that actually, if you work out the numbers and we had some fairly good power estimation models, this listening for the direction was eating up all the time, much more time than just listening for the packet data arrival. So maybe what you want to do is you want to listen to a subset of these directions, right? And so you would listen to a subset of directions and then say, okay, based on these directions, I don't know what happened in these other parts, but based on these directions, I'm going to make some measurements and then make some decision about, oh, maybe this time I still wanna track these directions, but I think I need to try out some other directions here. And that is a classic, you can solve that as a sort of partially observed Markov decision process, but anytime you see a partially observed Markov decision process these days, it makes you think that you could use some type of deep reinforcement learning. We just went with a traditional markup process, but I think going forward, there might be an interesting aspect there, looking at reinforcement learning techniques to try to um, solve this uh, problem. All right, so these were some sort of results that we got. Again, it's not uh, just using, um, uh, using just classic uh, techniques for partially observed markup decision processes. Again, I don't want to go into the results because that's not relevant here. There, you know, you could, but we have a package where we can evaluate these fairly in fairly detailed uh, detail, um, looking at different free key frequencies, 28 and 140. We had blocking the blockage models. We were also able to look at the effect of um, different beam forming architectures and so on. But so I think this is something if you're interested in collaborating, this might be an area that you might want to revisit. All right, uh, let me see, I've got about, uh, a little bit of time. Let's just walk through. I, I'd call this, well, th th this work that's been done here, but this is another area that it's kind of, I put future because I think the machine learning part is a part maybe for the, maybe for the future. Okay, so uh, a couple of years ago, about three years ago, I got very lucky um, to get involved in this project Comm Center, which is uh, a very large project 
um, for looking at terahertz communication. So uh, Santa Barbara is the lead, but it has kind of a who's who of all the big circuit designers. Uh, Mark Wadwell is the lead, but Jim Buckwalter, uh, Gabriel Rabiz, Ali Nikhil, all, all the people that you would know. Um, but NYU was looking at the systems part, which is basically taking these modules and trying to build uh, trans basically everything after the A to D, if you like, um, uh, uh, f uh, from this. So what um, one of the projects that I think it was relevant that came to mind that I thought I would talk about here was the whole issue of power optimization. So what we one of the key issues in millimeter wave and definitely when you get into the uh, frequencies above 100 gigahertz is the issue of power consumption because of course you have a large number of arrays that you're trying to support over very wide bandwidths. So we wanted to try to do a very careful um, optimization analysis of what the power consumption is and how we could optimize it. So we took a very detailed model of the whole front end of the uh, transceiver, including the LNAs, all the filtering and the, uh, and the uh, mixing, along with also some of the modeling of the power consumption of various digital, um, digital blocks. And we developed sort of a kind of end-to-end -end way to model these, but then on top of these to actually try to do some kind of end-to-end -end optimization of these of these parts to try to reduce the power. Now, there's obviously a power uh, performance trade-off, and it turns out that the power and performance are kind of pictured by two parts, but maybe I think that'll be clear on the next uh, slide. So, um, so what this graph is is the following. way to think about the power trade-off is this. So imagine I have some receive signal strength, and then depending on that receive signal strength, I'll get some SNR. Okay, so um, what you'll see is that in each curve, is a different design option, different design option for all, you have options for the LNA, the mixers, AGCs, the number of bits you place in the uh, ADC, the number of bits on your or FFTs and so on, right? So you have these options and you'll get the following, is that they all have these kind of, all of this kind of characteristics. So at the low um, SNR regime, what will happen is that the SNR that you will get will basically be governed by the noise figure of your amplifier because um, and that's sort of classical analysis. This is an area that is a regime which I don't think is that important. That you can't machine learning can't help you. You have Gaussian noise. There's nothing much you can do. But the, what you'll see is that they all tend to saturate at some level, and that saturation is because there's a signal dependent noise. There's a part of the noise, if you like, that's growing with the signal power, right? And so eventually that becomes dominant. And from a uh, communication standpoint, that's coming from either the nonlinear distortions in the front end, or it's coming from the finite precision, or it's coming from channel estimation errors or other sort of uh, for finite precision, either the ADD or the uh, like um, ba digital baseband processing. And that is actually what is very tightly coupled to the power consumption. So if, for example, out of that list, you wanted to increase the precision on the ADD, you would have to end up um, for burning more power because of course the power scales with the number of bits. Or if it's being blocked by the mixer, you would have to turn up the LO power on this. Now, how we could optimize that, that's a circuit question, but what one aspect of this is that all these saturation levels were just looking at simple linear receivers, basically treating all those nonlinearities as noise. The question is, could you maybe use some type of machine learning algorithm to do better receiver processing or more efficient processing? So for example, that the FFTs turned out to be actually quite power consumption, at least if you're in like a 28 nanometer process. And that's an area potentially that I think may have value. We have not yet explored it. That's why this was in the future part. But I think if you're thinking about this higher SNR regime, then um, this might be valuable. Now, the thing is, you might argue, well, cellular systems never need this SNR. That's uh, true. But um, there's two issues. One is that actually they need the dynamic range for out of band receiver rejection. But also, maybe what we can do is actually run these uh, algorithms here at some kind of much lower power consumption uh, or even push these down further and get um, more power savings and then uh, be able to use those algorithms. So that's kind of an area potentially a future work. Um, final thing I just want to wrap up with is um, this topic is where we're going to get data going forward. So I've used a lot of ray tracing so far just because it's uh, a huge, um, you can get the volumes of data. I think that will always be valuable. 
but I think at least to calibrate the ray tracers um, or maybe get some kind of individual measurements, we need more measurements. And that has become the big bottleneck, I think, for this. What we have been working with for the, for the comm center program is that we're now getting, we just brought up the receiver end. Well, okay, they built this receiver end of this, but what we were able to do was connect it into a very high power baseband processing board, which is this RFSOC. And you can actually get fairly high data rate links through this, um, through this board. And we've been able to just get the receiver up, but I think we're probably gonna get the transmitter up quite shortly. But there's also some very other interesting accelerators. There's, for example, Xilinx has just introduced something called this Versal ACAP board, which has actually these high power um, FPGA accelerators that are designed just specifically for machine learning applications. So this might be an interesting platform to think about both where we can get the data plus where we can actually get um, do machine learning experiments if we think that machine learning is an area that we want to use for um, reducing how power consumption. The other access that we have is where um, working was another big grant uh, called this Cosmos project, which is people have said this of limited value, which I, I, I totally understand the, the criticism. So this is run, uh, Rutgers is the lead institution. And this is on, Columbia is also um, part of this. And this is a large, maybe 20 block test bed that is being deployed in the upper Manhattan area, which is near the Columbia um, campus. So it has a lot of features which are useful for communication, but this could also be a very valuable tool potentially just simply for channel sounding on much larger scale in outdoor environments. Of course, you know, the operators probably have tons of data themselves, but they're never going to release that. So this is maybe you can easily just take these nodes and just run them as channel sounders and get volumes of data potentially um, once we get these millimeter wave nodes fully uh, up and uh, running. All right, I think that was all I wanted to say on the topic of um, sample projects. Uh, so I think maybe just before I go on, I think that, you know, they're, they're, they're projects, they have value. I don't think they're gonna fundamentally change the problems we have in millimeter wave, but they're probably interesting just at least in the optimization way of uh, doing some of these aspects. So let me go on to the other part. These were all in using ML for the purpose of um, improving millimeter wave, but let's take a look at the opposite of that part. So probably most industry couldn't care much about using ML for wireless. They're probably, if you hear ML and wireless, they almost always think about it in the opposite direction, which is using machine learning for enabling mobile AI. And so there's a large number of applications one can imagine. This was from a proposal which will probably get rejected soon, but anyway, it made at least the benefit of this proposal was that we came up with a nice little graphic. All right, so there's a large number of um, uh, applications that you can imagine that are using AI right now or machine learning, um, but where the con wireless connectivity can benefit. So you could imagine, for example, sensors would just naturally have to be connected, um, will often have to be connected wirelessly. You might want untethered experience with uh, VR, and then other things like UAVs and connected cars just have to be untethered. Plus, there's also a lot of power um, in handsets today for machine learning uh, accelerators. What wireless can do is potentially provide all of these devices with access to much higher computation power, which we know is what's needed to drive machine learning plus access to data. And, that, and there's a number of architectural improvements that they've done in the networks today to also bring these much closer forward, say edge computing to make the latency lower. So this is probably where most of the industry actually cares about on machine learning. Um, okay, whatever, some stats, uh, waste your time, this is some boilerplate on some industry people talk things that have a lot of value. So um, at the center here, we had a chance to work with a few really amazing faculty. So one of the, the faculty members that we hired, we actually hired a number of people in the area of robotics. So this is Ludovic Rigetti. And we started to try to understand with him, um, what is the value of so in, in, when you look at robotics control problems, so his area is actually in locomotion, is um, what happens is when you're trying to control a very high number of degrees of freedom robot, it will have a fairly high computational overload um, uh, overhead to try to compute 
those uh, um, the the um, the uh, force and uh, force controls. So the question is whether we could try to offload some of that. And so we investigated that in um, this uh, this paper. And uh, uh, there's there's actually a kind of interesting interaction which I won't go into here. It turns out okay. You, if you have a very high data rate connection, it's actually fine. But of course, on a millimeter wave link, it's very intermittent. So you have to basically put in some kind of um, hooks to make it adaptive. So I won't go into that, but that's the one area that we've been looking at. There's another area which we have not started looking at, but I think is something that I did want to uh, look at pretty uh, going forward. So pretty much every, um, uh, every mobile semiconductor manufacturer today is investing significantly in putting in mobile accelerators for AI based accelerators. So this picture you actually just grabbed from Qualcomm's website um, is one of their um, AI accelerators that they put into their hexagon uh, uh, DSB. Actually, it's interesting, it's in their DSB. It's not in their, um, it's not in their, uh, uh, ASIC. And these are really can accelerate basically all the deep learning patterns. So they've been working very carefully with other companies like Facebook to try to make AI enabled applications. And I think this is another area that is also super interesting from the mobile space. It's not again for wireless communication, but it's broadly connect associated with mobility. If we think about how to make very low power implementations of AI algorithms. Um, another project that we've been looking at is uh, with this really great professor, J.R. Rizzo. So he's actually a doctor in the med school, but he's just a fantastic engineer and he's um, vision uh, impaired himself. So uh, what he wanted to do was try to make the experience of um, uh, for visually impaired people better. So instead of just having a cane, what he built was this backpack. This is actually old. It's a, there's a much better version of this now. So this backpack has a number of cameras and then it will do some sort of scene sensing. And then um, that will that scene sensing will happen right now on a Jetson uh, GPU that's in that backpack, which is pretty heavy and can burn a lot of power. And then it will give some either haptic or audio feedback back to the person to help them navigate. So the question is, okay, can we get rid of this bag back? Can we take this wireless EM off going into the cloud? So that's something we've been investigating with him. So hopefully we'll have some results on this going forward. Oh, this is, um, there's, uh, okay, this is the, there's a number of people at the center um, that in fact had to work with that. I'm not gonna go into them uh, this here. So maybe that's kind of where I would wrap up with for this.